Hello, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining our session. Today, we're going to uh, continue on this fantastic uh, opportunity to discuss investment into the Great Green Wall by talking about some next generation solutions and really looking into innovation in financing for people and nature from the region, from the continent. So the first thing I'd just like to get across, if you take any message away from this session, is that what we, what we see is a, is, a, is a great green living wall. It's alive. It's not just a wall and it's not something that needs creating. There's, there's so much that is, is going on in this region already. So just to you know, put up this image from Wetlands International, it's, it's all connected. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's water, rivers, wetlands, watersheds. This is the lifeblood of, of the Sahel. And what we really want to see is fair and effective management of these watersheds as the priority for investment. So we, we see already that um, we're not starting from, from, from a, a blank space. There is a lot, as I said, there's a lot already happening. And part of what is happening relates to area-based nature conservation, protected areas, conserved areas, community conserved areas, private concessions. There's a whole host of different governance arrangements in place already. There's a rich tapestry of watershed conservation areas, watershed conservation efforts. And that these are, this is the foundation for investment and for the programs. Um, and if we can try to stitch together this tapestry, make one of these you know, beautiful um, kind of mosaics um, building from what we have in the region, then we will really be successful with this initiative. Um, some of the solutions that IUCN are involved in and our organization are involved in standards and solutions for systems and networks of these nature conservation areas. And through that, we're trying to focus on, on standards and platforms and learning that picks up on what is working. And today, ISA is going to explain a little bit more some of those case studies and some of the approaches. So we have a green list uh, standard for nature conservation areas, which describes effectiveness and success in these areas. And that can be used to verify the outcomes of these areas and could be really useful for investment and for helping the different countries in the region to implement the commitments that they have to global targets and global conventions. We see uh, technology as a key tool for nature conservation. It can be a challenge, but it's also, it, it's gonna unlock so much potential as well. And we're really interested in the private sector partnerships and bringing the innovation that the private sector is, is capable of into nature conservation and into the sustainable development uh, conversation. Connectivity, for example, one word that is key to nature and for people and also for technology. Technology to connect people will help people connect and will help them to keep nature connected and the ecosystems that they rely on connected as well. And we're working with uh, a partnership called Tech for Nature, which includes sponsors so far, such as Huawei, through their Tech for All initiative as well. All of this is good, standards, solutions, systems, partners, technology, but we need the resources. And the focus of this overall event is investment into the Great Green Wall. And we really see that there is so much opportunity for scaled up public-private financing for ecosystem services, for these protected and conserved areas, for the people living around them and for this connectivity between them. And we, we'd like in this session to touch a bit on uh, some of the different mechanisms, debt for nature, debt mechanisms. We have green list bonds, which we're exploring. And we're gonna hear especially from Candice and from uh, Amadou Bamba, some real tangible uh, ideas and solutions and success cases of how financing can be linked to protected areas on the continent and in this region. And we also will mention some of the digital technology and investment means. For example, we're working with the Parini Foundation on blockchain verification and distributed ledger technology for uh, ecosystem financing as well. So innovation is in here as also. So that's it from me. This, but just by way of introduction, I want you to look at this picture. That is when you hear great green wall, I want you to think living and I want you to think water and I want you to think forests, fountains of life, rivers of opportunity, streams for investment. And we all have it in our hands for the next generation, draw on the solutions well, to unleash the potential of youth and entrepreneurs in this uh, fabulous region. Thank you, James. Thank you, everyone. And thank you. Um, I will now start my presentation with Panorama, but also give um, an insight from solutions from the continent, from Africa. 
So when talking about Panorama, Panorama Solution for a Healthy Planet, it's a partnership initiative documenting and promoting examples of inspiring replicable solution across a range of conservation and sustainable development topics, enabling cross-sectoral learning and inspiration. Panorama allows practitioners to share their stories, get recognized for successful work, and learn how others have tackled problems across the globe by encouraging reflection on and learning from proven approaches. We have case studies documented as solutions. This is what we call solutions using a standard format that identify replicable key success factors. We call also building blocks. While I also uh, describing the context in which the solutions were implemented. Solutions are shared on the Panorama online platform. We have the partnership initiative, but also an online database and through various communication channels. And we integrate into them the capacity development activities, workshop. We also support their upscalings. So this learning and innovative methodology is applicable across topic sectors and audiences. Now the Panorama Partnership, it's a joint initiative by currently 10 partners. ICN and JZ provide an overall coordination function through a secretariat. Panorama is structured into thematic community. We call them sub theme. So these are intruders into Panorama for different community of practices. So each thematic community has a coordinating institutions. Sometimes they have co-coordinations with several organizations. Now we have the protected area thematic community, which is also uh, represented by a thematic uh, portal on the web platform. Among seven others, the protected area thematic community is led by IUCN Global Protected Area Program. It assembles and promotes solutions that showcase the contributions of protected areas to a multitude of challenges, such as climate change, food, and water security. It also promotes innovative approaches to protected area management as knowledge by IUCN Greenlist Global Standard. The community of practice of the protected area portal inspires a collective and innovative approach, bringing together the voices of practitioner and solution provider for knowledge and information sharing. Currently, the protected area portal has collected more than 380 solutions, almost 40, 400 solutions. And you can check them on the Panorama web platform. I have also selected some of our uh, solutions from Africa, which are linked with this thematic today, nature and finance. I will be really glad now to show you some of our solutions. First, we have the Apetana Nairobi Water Fund, which engages businesses, investment, but also nature solutions for water security. The Tana Watershed Fund worked with partners to create a water fund that design and enhance financial and governance mechanism, uniting public, private, and civil society stakeholders around a common goal to contribute to water security. So the water fund balances upstream and downstream interests by providing incentives to protect watershed services. So what happened, the impact is that they get 27 million small liters of water flowing into Nairobi each day, over 50% reduction in sediment concentration in river and more cost saving for Nairobi city water and sewerage company, which were $250 for them. So with solution, we also have building blocks that can be applied in different geographical or social settings and also replicated. Building blocks are key component of the solutions. They can be recombined, replicated by other practitioners. There are selected elements that made a difference and create change. We call them common success factors for a solution. Here we have a video that I would like to show you. Thank you, James. Touching the soil, I feel like I'm touching life. 
there's a delicate balance between soil and water for the 300,000 small-scale farmers growing coffee, tea and bananas in Kenya's Tana River watershed. For decades, forests on steep hillsides have been slowly converted to agriculture. Reduced soil productivity from erosion and competition for space have forced farmers onto steeper and steeper slopes. Now during the rainy season, soil is quickly washed into the Tana River, reducing the productivity of farmland and clogging water distribution and power generation facilities with sediment. But these issues don't remain in the watershed. The Tana River supplies drinking water to more than 9 million people, including 4 million people downstream in the capital city of Nairobi. With an unreliable water supply, many people are forced to buy jerry cans of water just to have enough to drink, cook and wash. Water security will only become more challenging as climate change brings increasingly unpredictable rainfall and the city's population continues to climb. That's why the Nature Conservancy is bringing diverse partners together to solve these challenges through the Upper China Nairobi Water Fund. Water funds are founded on the principle that it's cheaper to prevent problems at the source than it is to address them further downstream. Urban water users invest in upstream watershed conservation for the benefit of farmers, businesses and Kenyans throughout the region. In the Upper Tana watershed, the Nature Conservancy and its partners are working with more than 25,000 farmers and are on course to reach 50,000 farmers by 2022. We are providing the skills, training and resources they need to conserve water, reduce soil runoff and improve productivity. The goal is to improve livelihoods conserve habitat, and have more water flowing into Nairobi each day. Jane Kabugi, for instance, has learned how to dig trenches and plant napier grass to prevent soil runoff on her steep hillside farm. Stanley Kamenju has installed a system to collect and store rainwater for irrigation. Now he can grow and sell vegetables in the dry season when he can fetch a higher price. We can say now we are food secure using the water pans given to us by TNC. So we are very grateful for that. We are very stable farmers now. Our lives have been transformed. While the Nairobi Water Fund is the first of its kind in Africa, it builds on the expertise nature conservancy scientists have gained from designing more than 40 water funds around the world. The Upper Tana Nairobi Water Fund can now serve as a model to leaders across the continent as they look for solutions to growing challenges such as water scarcity, population growth and climate change. By investing in and protecting our sources of water, we can make a lasting difference for people in nature, in Kenya and across Africa. I would like to share with you also that the solutions, solution has been replicated in Colombia. So this is one solution among more than 800. So our, my second selected solution from the continent, thank you, James, he is about improving protected area management through business skill sharing partnership in Ghana. So what is the solution? The residential training program was facilitated by Shell Global Account Manager, private sector and public on the need and challenge of Mali National Park in Ghana. So they work together to write an action plan to focus on business priority needs for the protected area. So what happened? The change. They developed a proposal to finance the upgrading of road infrastructure and the park facility to enable Mole National Park to become more accessible and attractive to eco-tourists. They secured $30,000 to upgrade critical gambling road. And now the Mole National Park has its own website. They developed a marketing plan. They even successfully sourced over $130,000 from African Elephant Fund for the conservation of the park's elephant. Over the past nine years, the program has partnered 52 business mentors with 148 staff from 51 protected area across Africa and Asia. So now our 
third solution, the promotion of sustainable forest product from biosphere reserve in Ethiopia. So what the solution? The solution create link to private company that can certify wild coffee and honey and pay a premium price. They also created capacities in the farmers for quality productions. So what happened, the change there was that there was an increase of volume of ex exported wild sun dried coffee the sustainable market established for sun dried wild coffee, but also they had a high number of certified COP increase, which was from 80 to 26. 10,000 farmers also were trained in quality wild coffee production. 50,000 farmers were also trained in quality honey production. So this was also the first export experience by cooperatives. My name is Candace Stevens and I'm Head of Innovative Finance and Policy for Wilderness Foundation Africa. I also chair the SADC Region Sustainable Landscape Finance Coalition in partnership with WWF South Africa. And I'm going to be discussing not only the partnership around the coalition, but specific finance solutions that we've been working on and the approach we have in developing those finance solutions. So one of the things I constantly hear from stakeholders um, across South Africa and the static region and more broadly across the continent is that there simply isn't enough sustainable finance to launch all the initiatives we need to do to benefit social, environmental and economic considerations. And so the primary aim behind the coalition is really to address that specific need around sustainable financing and to move beyond our traditional business as usual approach and our traditional um, funding cycled approach to financing the type of work that we want to see at scale. That's really going to benefit beneficiaries in the end. So the finance solution um, context that I want to give is specific to South Africa. Um, and in looking at South Africa, there are a couple of key factors um, that are important to understand exactly how the finance solution for protected areas was created, what building blocks we used and how that can be translated into other areas such as the Sahel and the protected areas and watershed areas there. So South Africa is home to diverse cultures, languages and landscapes and it also hosts a number of exciting innovations not just with area-based conservation but also with conservation finance and we can really showcase how those two fit together hand in hand. South Africa also faces a number of fundamental challenges as a developing country. And so we need to address these challenges and enhance our opportunities at the same time. And enhancing those opportunities helps us to create sustainable and resilient green recovery, particularly um, post COVID-19. Importantly, our protected and conserved areas in South Africa and in similar context across the region offer cross-cutting conservation solutions. These conservation solutions have environmental benefits for biodiversity, for water, for food security, for ecosystem and ecological infrastructure, but also offer sustainable so, um, social and economic opportunities. But we need to make tailor-made finance solutions in order to achieve those benefits. So the coalition is essentially addressing that tailor-making process. And it's a catalytic and innovative driving force to create effective and enduring landscapes through finance solutions. The primary aim of the coalition, as I've mentioned earlier, is really around addressing the shortage in sustainable finance and has two main objectives. Those two main objectives are firstly, the creation of a of a conservation finance sector. Now, this is critically important in creating finance solutions that drive lasting benefits in landscapes. It requires the intersection of a number of different sectors, and it also requires the intersection between a number of different skill sets. And so in fostering this cohesive collaborative approach, we're able to pull the private sector in, the public sector, civil society, and see an interaction across stakeholders in various different regions. 
this network allows us to then pinpoint specific needs that might be needed for a project, an innovation, or an entire landscape. And then ultimately, the second objective is the development of new and innovative finance solutions to plug themselves into landscapes and see these initiatives go to scale and also to be replicated from one landscape to another. The coalition structure, which you'll see up on screen now, is facilitated through a steering committee, which operates the logistics behind the scenes. We also have a number of specialist contributors, and we really believe in the collaborative approach. These specialist contributors range from fintech experts to financial analysis to environmental economics, law, and other. We also have a national council, which is based in South Africa, and that council has a select number of seats that represent key sectors, which are traditionally siloed from one another in the past, but are now seeing advanced integration. So bankers are able to speak to those in the conservation sector, are then able to speak to those with legal expertise and to speak to national treasury and government interventions. We also have the Innovation Hub, which allows stakeholders to engage with one another. And importantly, the Innovation Hub has launched a number of finance solution incubators. You'll see those incubated listed up on screen, but essentially the incubators allow us to catalyze new finance solutions, to bring in finance that we haven't had before and provide specific interventions for lasting impact. The coalition also follows a four stage finance solution approach. And we fully believe in doing things in a strategic and deliberate manner so that we ultimately reach stage four, which is scalability. That first stage, which I've spoken about now in reference to the finance solution incubators is stage one. And that is an investigation into a specific finance solution with a group of niche experts. We've seen considerable progress in a number of these incubators, which have been able to have specific findings on a finance solution, which then translate into stage two, which is the strategy phase. And that, that phase specifically speaks to the development of a finance strategy or a feasibility study that allows us to have a roadmap for implementation under stage two. This roadmap for implementation is critical because what it does is it begins to unpack the building blocks required for a specific finance solution to be launched within a landscape or with a community of practice. And ISA specifically referred to building blocks in the panorama presentation and the solutions that are showcased on that platform. Those building blocks show what the critical success factors are for a particular finance intervention and how they're able to be translated into similar landscapes. And this really speaks to stage three, which is piloting, which is the actual practical testing of a finance strategy or a feasibility study into a landscape with the beneficiaries and stakeholders that it's aimed to impact. Ultimately, we want to be able to move to stage four, which is scalability. A lot of pilot projects across the country and across the region um, have incredible innovation in them and just require that little bit of additional impetus to move to the next level where they can translate beyond their local context into a broader national and regional and continental context. What I wanna to touch on now is a specific finance solution within the South African context that has gone to scale. It followed the four stage approach, which I spoke about previously in its incubation, its feasibility study, piloting, and then ultimately its scale. And essentially this finance solution was created as a result of the five primary building blocks, which I'll speak to, but importantly, it was created for South Africa's protected areas and the protected areas themselves provided the cornerstone for the creation of a brand new finance solution that's dedicated towards biodiversity conservation and has enormous benefits, particularly in South Africa's wildlife economy for sustainable growth and job creation. To date, section 37 capital D of South Africa's Income Tax Act, and I won't bore you with all the tax intricacies of this, but it's introduced approximately 13.5 million US dollars, which is around 200 million South African Rand, 
directly into the country's protected area system. We estimate by 2026 that this amount will be around 83 million US dollars or 1.4 billion South African Rand, which is an enormous injection into the country's protected areas. The loss to the fiscus is very small, um, but the return on investment is approximately 180% through this fiscal instrument. This is notably with regards to state-owned um, landscape management costs, and we've received considerable support from the South African government through National Treasury and the South African Biodiversity Institute for this innovation. Tax efficiency may sound incredibly boring, but it has a key role to play with small to medium enterprises, which is vital for a developing nation. SMMEs receiving tax efficiency are shown to decrease their costs, increasing their liquidity, and ultimately this boosts their resilience and their ability to grow, particularly within new green sectors. South Africa is seeing a large amount of marginalized areas on the borders of protected areas in dire need of increased SMME support and increased opportunities around wildlife economy. And section 37 capital D is one instrument that is tailor-made for protected areas with benefits along the value chain in wildlife economy for communities in the country. When we look at this finance solution, it has key building blocks that can be replicated in other regions. These key building blocks um, essentially are strong collaboration across sectors, which is something that the coalition has replicated um, in all of its finance solution investigations, regardless of the stage that the finance solution is at. This is critically important, um, the integration between public, private and civil society to address large scale challenges and come up with innovative solutions. The second key building block is niche technical skills. This was particularly true with the biodiversity tax incentive that I've described because it required technical tax skills in order to implement the finance solution. And it's something that we can see in a number of finance interventions is to have the right specialist contributor on board. Thirdly, we look at having a cohesive community of practice. In South Africa, the biodiversity stewardship community of practice allowed the tax incentive to translate across landscapes because of that cohesive community of practice. In addition, we ensured that during stage three and piloting of the tax incentive, that there was substantial grassroots engagement. This is vital so that whatever finance solution intervention is placed into a landscape, it actually addresses the needs of the stakeholders and beneficiaries that it has impact for. And then lastly, the strong legislative and policy framework for protected areas within the country allowed us to attach the tax incentive to that legislative and policy framework with the right checks and balances and governance structures as well as effective management. And this is an example of how protected areas and conserved areas within a region such as the Sahel can provide cornerstones for the creation of new finance solution interventions. I hope that this is able to showcase the power of innovation as well as the power of area-based conservation and how the two can come together to have benefits for the environment, for people, and ultimately for economies as well. Thank you, James. Uh, the African Development Bank is quite involved in this initiative of a great uh, green world. Uh, we have made a commitment and I think uh, this kind of session is a good uh, opportunity for us, not only to learn more, but to explore how we can uh, develop uh, uh, collaboration with other partners and mostly with ICN. Uh, that is linked to the bank with uh, MOU, a memorandum of understanding. So we have done a lot of work in the field with uh, IECN. So, so when, when, when it comes to this topic, uh, before I come to the list of solutions that uh, uh, I would propose, is just to say that for the African Development Bank, um, we have done a lot of work when it comes to protected areas uh, conservation. Uh, our door of entry most of the time was institutional support. What I call institutional support is 
in many countries where we have intervened, the first thing that we were um, noticing was the difficulties, the concerns, and the limit that uh, these agencies or department in charge of protected areas was facing. So I think uh, we all agree that mostly in the Sahel region where we are dealing with uh, the poorest country in the world, uh, the agencies that are supposed to implement this kind of policies and action and civilians on the field are facing a lot of difficulties. So institutional support, meaning uh, supporting these agencies and these institutions to us is very crucial. Of course, it's not something that is sustainable because once you do it so that they can carry on their, their missions, you have to, 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 to go to another step. And the next step, uh, most of the time, was how to put value on these protected areas. Uh, I think there's a wide consensus right now that unless you put this economic value, it's very difficult, very difficult in these developing countries to, 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 to promote uh, protected, uh, protected areas conservation. So we were working on what we call valorization, putting value on protected areas. Uh, we have designed many projects and many programs early in the 2000s and mid 2000s. But the results were not what we expected because we were dealing with the public sector. And right now, also, I think there's another consensus that uh, private sector is, is a main actor when you want to promote uh, good value on uh, protected areas. And we are working on that in mostly in the Congo Basin and in Southern Africa, mostly in Madagascar. And I'm delighted to say that uh, one of the projects that I'm managing, I'm preparing right now is in Madagascar and the feasibility studies have been undertaken uh, by uh, IUCN. So what we're trying to do is just to, again, the institutional support uh, for the Madagascar National Parks, but uh, we are also trying to see how we can uh, develop some activities that can attract the private sector to invest uh, in these uh, protected uh, areas. Uh, another thing, James, that I want to pinpoint when it comes to the green world, and that is a lesson that we have learned, is to have this kind of regional approach. I mean, we're talking about the Sahel region. We have many countries. And I think uh, for these times, we have to really develop the transboundary approach, uh, not uh, intervening, for example, in Senegal, in Mali, or in Burkina Faso, but trying to see the protected areas that are crossing uh, political borders. I'm saying that because we are in this pandemic of, uh, of uh, COVID. And uh, I think uh, we have to be very efficient. I mean, every single dollar should count when it comes to protected areas. And if we have this kind of regional approach, I think we can be more efficient and uh, uh, saving more resources that are gonna go back uh, to the needed uh, uh, communities. So regional approach, transboundary approach is something that I would do really ask people to think when we go to intervention. And that goes to this theory that we have learned at school, uh, this regional public goods, the RPGs. Uh, it was a theory that has been developed by the World Bank. And I think it was in theory, but in Southern Africa, they did it uh, with this uh, concept of peace parks. And I think uh, in, the, in the Sahel region, it is something that we can, uh, try to learn more and try to see how we can uh, apply it. So when it comes to the solution, I think um, from my experience and being in a uh, development agency, uh, the first thing that I would say again and again is the institutional support. Unless those who are in the field are being supported to carry out the emission, it would be very difficult for us to reach the goals that we assign ourselves. Private sector is a sine qua non, meaning it's a, a must for us to have it as an ally. And when it comes to the developing countries, private sector, you have to attract it because they have a lot to do, maybe in infrastructure, in financing, et cetera. So, uh, and the attraction, maybe, maybe to put some kind of small 
infrastructure in protected areas to make sure that we have management plans to make sure that we limited the, the poaching so those gap action can attract the private sector and the third one is the transboundary approach to have the regional approach and i'm not saying that because i'm a conservationist uh, but i'm saying that because this is going to help us in the finance i mean resources are very scarce right now and uh, having is a holistic approach can help us to be more efficient on the ground. So uh, another thing also that I would advocate is to work in our money. Um, the grid, uh, the forces initiative, you will see that there are many, many organizations, uh, IUCN is being involved, WWF, and other many international. So I think it's good for us to develop the harmony, the cooperation, again to increase our efficiency and uh, in the field so overall james these are the points that i wanted uh, to develop uh, trying to respond to your uh, question hoping that i will have some questions in which i can bring more uh, more uh, clarity thank you thank you thanks so much that's really really interesting amadou that's it's really really spot on in terms of next generation um, you echoed what Candice had presented uh, with the scale that's needed and, and working regionally, working transboundary. I think that um, you know we're only going to get to scale once we once we look at you know how these areas are connected and how we can um, you know really really get beyond site by site by site. Um, I also totally uh, agree with the the harmony. Uh, we need to we really need to to join the dots better. We need that connectivity amongst ourselves as well as supporting organisations and entities and. And I think that that um, idea of, of harmony um, will bring us to somebody who's uh, very harmonious, but also likes to disrupt and get things going and bring some energy to it. So I'm delighted to invite um, Issam Shlu uh, to ans answer the same question. Uh, what, what does next gen solutions mean to you and especially for this region? We launched with a group of people, um, the Bamako Green City Movement, or in French, Bamako Vilbert, which is pretty much trying to see ways in which, as a community, we can help, um, you know, replant the city. And as you may know, um, you know, the Great Green Wall crossed through the Sahel. Uh, Mali is a, is a key country in the Sahel. It's a big country. And unfortunately, because of, um, you know, poverty, population pressure, um, and lack of economic resources, um, this has led to destruction of um, our, our flora. Essentially, what, really, um, what I've learned from this community grassroots movement, what we've learned is that water is life. Water is really life. Mm -hmm. If there's no water, you cannot have anything. So now the National Water Company um, is, is coming and they're helping us now to, put, um, to, put, uh, to reopen well, the water on the avenue. So they're working at the moment, so very exciting. We can't wait for it to finish. Uh, Amadou Maature uh, from Senegal. Uh, he's an MBA in political science and international relations. And he's also an expert in uh, environmental conservation, biodiversity planning, development planning, and alternative finance. So real talented uh, colleague uh, of ours at IUCN. Um, and he's currently leading multi-country collaboration um, on various aspects, including with IIED, exploring debt finance mechanisms and debt for nature arrangements in West Africa. So thanks so much, Amadou, for joining us. And uh, the floor is yours to tell us briefly your uh, idea of what Next Gen Solutions could be. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, hi, James. Hi, everybody. Uh, I will speak on, on behalf of IUCN PACO, uh, the office based in Dakar, Senegal. I am very uh, pleased to join this uh, panel to discuss with you the next gen solution led by IUCN or uh, Dakar office. Uh, at, the, at, this, uh, at, this, uh, at the regional level, we identify two solutions we, we, we are working on. Uh, the first one is to, to improve stakeholders' participation in green economy and sustainable finance policy uh, development. To give you a general context on that, we all know that uh, significant and rapid economy, societal and institutional transformation is now on the way to meet Agenda 2030 SDG. 
commitments and uh, UNFCCC climate goals. And to deliver well being and prosperity with uh, one planet limits. Uh, urgent action on the global climate and environmental crisis is uh, underway on many fronts to achieve safe, sustainable, and just world. Uh, this uh, includes action to reform the financial system that drive unsustainable and inequitable economies. Uh, local green economies offer considerable potential to hasten national transition to green sustainable economies. And that's what IUCN is working on with uh, IIED. Uh, maybe just to give you a small uh, definition of a local uh, econ green enterprise. Uh, it is a micro, small and uh, medium sized enterprise that has a uh, a potential positive effect on the global or local environment community, society or economy, and is a business that strives to meet triple bottom line returns. Uh, the action uh, led by IUCN in collaboration with IID will build on the inclusive dialogue process, processes they have already established in the target countries to focus on sustainable finance and the environmental, environment climate for local green enterprise. Uh, by convening local green enterprise with policymakers, civil society organization, financial institutions, in a series of inclusive dialogue, uh, the action will build a great understanding of the barrier experienced by local green enterprise and the opportunities which uh, may the, uh, be available to them. And uh, it will also bridge these often disconnected groups of stakeholders to build a better common understanding uh, from, of course, the different perspective. And uh, the action uh, at, the, at the end will cover at least 350 key stakeholders through uh, inclusive dialogue process in Senegal. Uh, the involvement of uh, local stakeholders voices and experiment experiences in this dialogue at local and national levels enable improved stakeholder participation in green economy and sustainable finance policy development and what we are doing at the first step is to to to, to make an analysis uh, we call that the contextual finance analysis and this aim to give information on three points uh, the first one is about economy. Uh, we will explore what is the situation of local green enterprise here in Senegal and uh, in the region. And the second one is about finance. And uh, what we are doing is to identify signature issues. We are going to mapping the, 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 call, the, the regularity landscape, mapping the financial landscape, institution and products, and map mapping the stakeholder landscape and macro data. And uh, at the end, we are going also to, 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 to give uh, more information about the current in, in environment here in Senegal in the region. That is the first uh, point that I will discuss is with you. The second one is uh, to support local communities in uh, conserving the marine and terrestrial environments and life whose truth depth restructuring for natural and climate outcomes in Cabo Verde, Mauritania, Senegal, and Guinea-Bissau. This is the second action led by IUCN. And this action will uh, prepare the depth restructuring deals for natural and, uh, and, and climate outcomes to address the triple crisis of biodiversity loss, climate change, and depth in the coastal West Africa region of Cabo Verde, Mauritania, Senegal, and, and, and Guinea-Bissau. Uh, maybe also to, to give you also a, a, a general context that we know that uh, debt was a major concern for these countries pre-COVID-19 and has now been hugely exacerbated by the economic shock. Uh, linking the post-COVID-19 uh, debt relief to climate resilience and natural sweat can help support a green and inclusive post-COVID-19 recovery. Post-COVID-19 
that really provides an opportunity to, to, to massively scale up trough budget support with appropriate fiduciary safeguards where creditors provide relief direct into a debt governance budget when agreed climate and uh, biodiversity targets are met. Uh, and in the, in the right region context, this upscale approach of budget support has three main impacts. To increase the size of funds being swapped, to increase government ownership and, uh, and commitment through the budget process, and uh, this will translate into executive impact of more active, effective natural climate and SDG outcomes such as marine and, uh, and terrestrial pr protected area, sustainable natural resource management, and increased climate resilience, particularly in a post-COVID-19 uh, context. Uh, the objective of this uh, action is to scope our debt restructuring, restructuring in these four West Africa countries and support the two most likely countries to prepare debt deals. Uh, preliminary discussion by, by, by the part, project partner uh, indicates some interest already in debt swap in all four countries. A swap will be instrument, debt relief will be presented by the reduced debt uh, servicing payment and uh, restructuring in the process of reducing the negotiation of debt. And the aim of the swap is to reduce debt either by conversion to local currency or paying a lower interest rate or lower coupon in the case of bonds or some forms of debt wide off. And the money saved should be investing through the national budget to support program to result based key performance indicator of natural and climate outcomes. Uh, that's what we ex expect to do. And uh, we, we are going to, to, to work in many activities. And uh, uh, the first one is to analyze uh, depth and instrument design. And for that, uh, IUCN will, uh, will, uh, will, 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 will make an assessment of depth structure key criteria, uh, debt sustainability and uh, sovereign risk for each country with design of the appropriate instrument from the budget with appropriate fiduciary safeguard by IIID working in partnership with Banker without boundaries. Uh, the second action is uh, to review a government policies and program on natural and climate resilience to identify results and performance criteria against which debt relief can be provided. Uh, the third action that we are going to conduct in this, uh, in this project is on the debt, debtor uh, side, we will seek to engage with both Ministry of Finance and Debt Management Offices uh, and Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Fisheries, local authorities and social society actors uh, to engage with creditor stakeholders uh, vary according to each country's debt restructuring and will be supported by the, uh, the, the, the MAVA funded informal debt working group uh, uh, in Senegal. And the, 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 the fourth and last action is uh, to deal prepared and country implementation strategy. And this step will involve uh, working with the national government to develop a work plan and modalities to implement a debt for climate and uh, natural program swap with agreed next step and accepted impacts, including key performance indicator from a swap. And that's what we are going to do. Uh, and uh, IUCN will lead this action in, this, uh, in, the, in the West African subregion. And we work with the different partner uh, as uh, IIID, as I mentioned it, uh, BWB, Bankers Without Boundaries, UNECA, United Nations uh, Commission for Economic for Africa, and also Triple GI, GGGI, Green, uh, Global Green Growth uh, Institute. And that was the, 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 the two actions uh, led by IUCN I, 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 I will share with you and I am available for the discussion and to give you more details on that. Thank you very much, James. 
Thank you so much, Amadou. That was really clear and very informative. Um, and that really is next next generation is dealing with some of the debt issues of the last generation. And you know, we should not saddle the youth with the problems and uh, this weight and burden. Um, and I, I really like the idea that you've expressed, especially at looking at um, you know, mechanisms which will allow more public investment in the kind of the infrastructure, the regulation, the policies, the type of things that um, uh, Amadou. Um, was was talking about um, earlier on, and um, yeah, we're really interested to to see you know how these uh, the collaboration with IIED, the collaboration with the different countries works out, and and I think that there really could be a um, a key here in terms of being able to scale up some of the investment um, across the Great Green Wall region. So let's um, let's really uh, watch this space, and you know, as IUCN, we're very keen to to offer experience and to share the lessons of this uh, more regionally. Um, we're, we have about uh, 20 minutes left, so I'm going to now, because we've heard from Isa and uh, Candice, just very quickly, Isa, maybe just like one, one minute, just on, on what, what does NextGen solution mean to you? Yes, thank you, James. Uh, for me, I see that uh, with, with the youth growing on the continent, like we have now 200 million people aged between 15 and 24, uh, yes, older. So Africa is a continent with the highest population of youth, accounting for 90% of the global youth population. So the, the, the youth meet has fragmented negative perception attributed to millennials. They remain committed to finding solution and consider themselves ready to contribute. So from my part, I'm part of the millennials. So I'm part of the solution. So youth has a unique role to play and value. They can provide as innovator and cultural ambassadors. They can also serve as peer-to-peer -peer facilitators, community mobilizers, and advocate. But we can also see young people has um, the, the, the positive energy that can hold the government for uh, uh, they can hold to account on the SDGs because we have the SDGs and we have to have the young people to see what has been the, as you said now, what has been the, the, the laws, what has been the decision taken before and they are being impacted by the, the, the decision. And now they can be a positive force a sustainable development should not only mean consideration for the environment, but also future the generation where they will live in the quality of life they can and they should enjoy. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, right on and uh, yeah, very, very clear. Um, youth is, is part of the future. And maybe if I could just ask then uh, Candice, just for your, your quick thoughts, um, following on from your excellent presentation, what, uh, what does next gen mean to you? Thanks, James, um, and thank you for all the insights from co-panelists on, on what next-gen solutions are. It's incredibly inspiring and insightful. In my perspective, the solutions really look at moving beyond traditional funding mechanisms, moving beyond business as usual, and starting to see an integration between finance um, and the environment and social impacts um, in a way that we've never seen before and really looking at how to have impacts across those three. Um, despite the challenges, there are incredible opportunities. And for me, this requires a lot of cohesion to be able to have that level of integration. And so to see the different expertise, different sectors talking to one another, as opposed to you know, preaching to the choir, so to speak, um, engaging across sectors and across age groups, across um, regional boundaries is really critical. Um, and then the other for me is really looking at your area-based conservation as cornerstones um, to financing solutions. Um, and we've seen it happen in South Africa and, and across the continent in different ways. It's just the scale that we need to see protected and conserved areas coming to the fore to be able to address environmental, social and economic considerations. And when they have strong governance structures and effective management, they're able to create additional finance solutions. Thank you, Candice. That's, uh, that's really clear. Yes, area-based conservation. And, and that is uh, really um, great timing because that brings us to the second question. And now our time is short for this. We've been so en engrossed in this. So I, I'm just going to really link it as you just did. 
uh, to uh, nature conservation areas and how they can be part of the solution. And so I'd, I'd like to just invite maybe Amadou Diop to give us just a, a key insight from your perspective from the bank on how this can be done. Bamba. All right, thank you, James. <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, and thank you for all the panelists. I mean, uh, like Candy says, this is very in insightful and uh, we have learned a lot. Like I said, <clears throat> we are a development agency and uh, we have made a commitment. I'm, if I'm not mistaken, we are around, for the green, uh, great green world, around 2 billion of US dollars. I mean, even more, I think. Um, so uh, I think uh, we are at the stage of brainstorming, of thinking and of elaborating uh, collaboration. Uh, I think from here, if we can have a roadmap that gonna guide us uh, to move forward. I know also there is a secretariat. And like I said, to create this kind of umbrella in which all actors, all partners can communicate, I think that would be great. And we are a bank, we are a regional bank. And I think for this kind of initiative, it's good to have uh, a financial uh, institution along with you. Uh, the matter is not only money, it's ideas, it's a commitment, et cetera. But uh, I think uh, we can be a good partner and we already have made the commitment. The next step is just to see how we can implement things over the, uh, on the field. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's great. So I, I'm going to just jump to the recommendations because we have about two minutes. And really the recommendations to tie to the, to the, to the Great Green Wall Initiative. And in preparation for this panel, we discussed um, you know, a great green living wall, um, the idea of innovation hubs, um, the process that Candice was, was explaining around, in and around protected areas. This happens outside the capitals. This happens in areas that are sometimes hard to access, rural communities and so on. But if you can combine that, the type of energy that um, uh, Issam was, was describing, then you know, that, would be, that would be great. Uh, that is something we could really focus on bringing protected areas in as being part of the solution and not just protected areas like nature reserves, wildlife conservation areas, but the more kind of, you know, area-based conservation, this, this other effective area-based conservation measures that is now part of global, uh, global policy, global targets, really looking at traditional forms, community-based conservation areas, multiple use zones. There's a whole range of things that we could do. And as you can see for this map, you know, we need to maintain the connectivity around these key watershed areas and around the river. And then we've really heard a lot about the public private, private finance and how to scale these things up, exploring debt for nature mechanisms that, that enable government policies to really reach and to be able to be enacted and legislated properly, but enable a uh, uh, private sector to join, not just on CSR, which I think is great, you know, getting more CSR, but also on these larger commitments and on kind of actual investments that are, you know, win-win, triple bottom line, as we heard also from, from Amadou. So I just um, just leave it there. Just one last word from from you've got like twenty seconds. So I'll start with Isam. One last uh, message for us, please. Unmute. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. So I was saying uh, that the message is urgency to act and acting together. Thanks. Yeah, exactly. This umbrella that uh, that uh, that we put forward. Um, Candice, you're you're on screen. From my side, it's it's definitely around innovation to think outside the box um, and push all the parameters of our understanding to do new things that we've never done before. Thanks, Candice. Absolutely, break barriers, new things. Amadou Toure, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my last message is maybe a proposition from IUCN to the preferred solution we can give on this is an adoption of an EBA ecosystem based adaptation approach for conservation, sustainable management and restoration of the forest and savanna grassroots ecosystem. That is a good solution and I want to share with you this. Thank you. Thank you, and Isa and I fully behind you on that recommendation. Ecosystem-based adaptation, ecosystem yeah. restoration, ecosystem conservation, that's the key to it. And um, Isa, please, 20 seconds. Yes, thank you, James. I think I would like to say now, like we need to establish partnership 
with banks, private sectors, and other actors, as well as the, the African Development Bank present here. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Amadou Bamba, your last words with you. Thank you, James. Um, urgency, of course, we need to act right now, but let's uh, uh, learn from our, I would say, mistakes, because they are there have been many regional uh, uh, programs. So let's scrutinize them and see what went wrong and we can rectify it in this new one. Thank you. Thank you so much. So that's the recommendations. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for listening. Thank you for joining us. And uh, yes, we'll, we'll present these recommendations back to plenary and um, enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you to all the speakers. I'm really, it's a privilege to have had you here. And uh, to thanks all, all the supporters, all the organizers, all the logos that are on here. Um, and um, yes, stay safe, stay well. Thank you. Thank